So in the next module now we shall see what is the benefit of having such an orthogonal set, okay? particularly in view of the problem we have concerned ourselves with for such a long time that is to solve equations like Ax is equal to B. All right. Now consider A matrix that is given like so, A1, A2 until Ak, all right. So what are these? These are all tuples of numbers, okay. So suppose these are all M tuples. Suppose this is the case and you have been asked to solve as usual Ax is equal to B, right? And suppose you have been told So exactly the setup for what we've just studied. Suppose that the columns, which are familiar vectors like tuples of numbers, m tuples of numbers. So these columns of numbers that we have now, a1 through ak, these constitute an orthogonal set of vectors in the Euclidean space, m-dimensional Euclidean space, and they don't contain zero. So immediately what do you know? Full column rank, obviously, right? Because this is a linearly independent set. What sort of a matrix do you think this is if it's full column rank? Yeah? Can it be a fat matrix? Tall. Square at best, but in general it's going to be tall. So obviously we'll assume that M is greater than, greater than or equal to K. Right? Now, with this additional condition that's being given to us, we shall now see how this translates to a simple solution. Okay, any questions? So what we have is basically something like this, x1 times a1 plus x2 times a2 plus dot 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 till xk times ak is equal to b and we want to solve for these x1 through xk where of course where x is equal to x1, x2. So as this is, this is the column picture of the system of linear equations. Instead of looking at them as equations, you know, those hyperplanes and those biases that we have introduced, this is just those columns. And does this, does there exist a linear combination of the columns of A that equals B? Conversely, the question is, does this vector B which is already a fixed vector given to us, belong to the image or the column span of the matrix A. Yeah, and if so, then find me that particular combination. So now that we've been given that this is an orthogonal set, what do you think we should go ahead and do? See, orthogonality comes only in case of inner products. So obviously, there is an inner product in this space and you know these, these inner products. These are just dot products, real vector spaces. This is also familiar to us. So what do we go ahead and do? What do you think we should do? So this is my important equation. Let's name this equation one. Yeah? Take the dot product of both the sides with? Any AI, yeah. So we can take the dot product because this is a scalar. So the dot product will be essentially with this vector. Yeah. And then every time we take the dot product with any AI, it's dot product with or inner product with the other AIs apart from 
the chosen i itself will vanish because of the orthogonality. So what I can say from here is <coughs> that x i is going to be nothing but the inner product of a i with b divided by the norm of a i squared. Do you agree? Yeah. So this is exactly that scalar that I am looking for. And what will it look like in terms of matrices then? What is what operation is this equivalent to? If I want to write it in a compact form, so suppose I stack these fellows up like so, A1 transposed, A2 transposed, AK transposed. Is this not the same as A transposed? Yeah. So if I hit this uh, equation here, maybe use a different color. So if I hit this purple equation with A transposed on both sides, what will that lead to? A transposed A x is equal to A transposed B, right? What do I know about the structure of this A transposed A? Now take a look at this A transposed and take a look at this A and tell me what happens when you get this multiplication done like A transposed A. Identity? Not really identity. Huh? Yeah, it's a square matrix of course of size K cross K, no doubt. It's just a diagonal matrix. Are any of the diagonals zero? Can any of the diagonals be 0? Why not? Because we have ruled out this. So what you are essentially looking at then, let me erase this starred assumption which is all too important here, but what we then land up with is something like maybe I should write the second term too. So maybe I can also write this A transpose B as, what is this going to be? And there you have it, exactly this expression, is it not? Because each of those diagonal entries, yeah, they are non-zero. So this matrix is invertible. This is a diagonal matrix as the D inverse exists, right? So this is the motivation behind looking for this property of orthogonality. But we are not done yet. I mean, if life were so easy that every time you encounter an equation of the form AX is equal to B, where the columns of A are orthogonal conveniently, then all you need to do is just hit them with A transposed on both sides and then invert a diagonal matrix which is very easy to do and that's it. Yeah, so life is not always that simple. However, we might come up with a system of equations like so where except for the orthogonality there is something nice. By that I mean that at least this is full column rank. Now we wonder then that if we are given a system of equations of the form AX is equal to B with A having full column rank, which is to say that the columns of A are linearly independent, but no claims about orthogonality. Can we somehow massage this? Yeah. To look at an equivalent system of equations, which does indeed turn out to be like so with that assumption going. That is, the columns are not just linearly independent, but they're also orthogonal and do not contain a zero vector. 
yeah. So given that the, then the, the more sophisticated question is when you bring yourself out of this realm of matrices is given a bunch of vectors that are linearly independent, can you cook up another bunch of vectors that are not just linearly independent but also orthogonal and on top of that what more? You must be talking about the same problem, right? So what is sacrosanct in this problem? Exactly. So the image of that matrix A that is given to you whose columns may not be orthogonal and the image of the new matrix that you might be getting should be identical because you're looking for a solution to the same problem. So you should want this new set of orthogonal vectors which you might have cooked up if possible to also span the same vector space. That is a span of the set of linearly independent vectors that has been given to you through columns of an arbitrary matrix that is going to have full column rank must be the same as the span of the set of the same number of orthogonal vectors. Okay. So the question is can this be done? Can we get such a such a set of orthogonal vectors? And the beauty about this result is not only is it an affirmative answer that is it can be done but it is a very constructive answer. The way the proof of this result follows also shows you not just that the fact that such a set exists but also how to go about constructing such a set, such an orthogonal set. So that is what we shall call the or we call rather the Gram-Schmidt procedure and we shall now take a look at how this allows us to go from any linearly independent set to a, an orthogonal set of vectors which span exactly the same. In fact, it does a little more than that as will be apparent from uh, what we shall now show. But I want you to remember that the motivation is to again solve problems like these Ax is equal to B, right? The motivation stems from there. So here goes, suppose V an inner product space has a set of linearly independent vectors. say S is equal to V1, V2 till Vn, right? there exists a set W given by W1, W2, Wn such that inner product of W i with W j is equal to 0 for i not equal to j. So that is the first which essentially means that W is an orthogonal set of vectors, right? And the span of V1, V2 till Vk is equal to the span of W1, W2 
to w k for k belonging to the set 1, 2, okay, something very, very interesting. So, we are not just saying that the overall set W is going to span the same subspace as the span of S, but we are also saying that if you go ahead and pick out some arbitrary number of fellows from this set S, okay, and you go ahead and pick out the same number of fellows starting from the left, that is the order must be preserved, then each such subspace within that subspace overall span must also equal, okay. So, <clears throat> of course, um, it also comes with another benefit that if i is equal to j, you can make all of these unit norm, okay, in which case sometimes people use the term orthonormal set. So, when the inner product of a vector with itself is, which is the norm of the vector is unity, it is a unit norm vector. So, when you have a set of vectors, each of whose norm is unity and each and it is an orthonormal, orthogonal set, you sometimes say it is an orthonormal set of vectors, okay. So, this is basically the claim that is there in this Gram-Schmidt procedure, okay. So, you have corresponding to this linearly independent set, you have this orthogonal set, right. And once you have that, then you can reformulate your problem of solving Ax is equal to b, as is obvious, right. Because the column span of this and the column span of this would be equal, right. So, it is just about a choice of basis. If you can represent a vector b in terms of the basis that is given by the w's, you can also represented in terms of the basis given by the v's, you know how the basis transformation works, right. So, I want you to understand that once you have solved it for this, it is as good as solved for this too, right. So, that is a huge plus when you are dealing with inner product spaces. So, how do we go about proving this? The proof will constitute in showing the following facts. So, I, I hope I can erase this, right, this is clear. So, we shall proceed by mathematical induction. Okay, so by mathematical induction, that is going to be our go to strategy. So, suppose n is equal to 1, I mean there is really nothing to prove. In that case, S is just V1, choose W to be just v1 upon norm v1 and you are done, there is nothing to prove here really, right. So, this is the base step, right. So, suppose now n is equal to 2, what do you do? Any ideas? What can we do? Now, suppose you have the set V1, V2. Once again, you can go ahead and choose, sorry, this is W1. Once again, you can go ahead and choose W1 in much the same manner as you chose it here. But how do you choose W2? Yeah? Ah, uh, projection. We have not yet spoken about what projections are, we will deal with them shortly, but uh, not in today's lecture surely. Uh, so, what do we do? What is it? What do you mean by projection basically? Maybe in terms of the uh, definitions that we have introduced so far, you can talk about it. Again, dot product is very specific to Euclidean spaces. So, you can actually dictate the term to me if you, what do you think this is going to be? So, for n is equal to 2. S is equal to V1, V2, yeah. So, let W1 is equal to V1 by 
norm v1. Sorry. Oh, I don't need this, right? So this is, sorry. Yeah, that's what it is. What about w2? What can I do about w2? How do we define w2? So this is remember but what we are defining. So you might as well put this symbol here. What do we do? Yes? V1 minus or rather V2 minus what do we take? What do we subtract from it? That's it. That's just a scalar, right? Sure. Something is missing? Yeah. So what we are saying essentially is V2 minus V1 inner product with V2 times V1 upon norm v1 squared. So of course you can go ahead and check that the span of w1 is the same as the span of v1. There's only two things to check here and then you have to check that the span of w1 uh, v1 v2 is equal to the span of w1 w2. So first of all just notice here what is given to us that v1 v2 is a linearly independent set. So can this w2 vanish? I wonder because if this w2 vanishes then it is no good to us. Can W2 equal to 0? Why not? If W2 is equal to 0, then that means this equals 0. If this equals 0, then this is a linear combination of linearly independent fellows with a certifiable non-zero coefficient at least here. So therefore, this linear combination cannot vanish because V1 and V2 at least is a linearly independent set that's given to us. So therefore, this w2 is definitely a non-zero, non-trivial vector. What is the next thing we have to check then? This thing that we have constructed, is it indeed a part of an orthogonal set? That is, is inner product of w1 and w2 going to be orthogonal at all? Of course, you might say, we might still need to normalize this. Well, it doesn't matter, you see. Don't normalize this, don't normalize this. Let's not choose an orthonormal set. Let's just choose an orthogonal set. Yeah, that normalization we can do uh, when we are actually constructing explicitly those vectors. For the, for the time being, we have just claimed orthogonality, orthogonality, not orthonormality. So let's just take the inner product of W1 and W2. What happens? That's like taking the inner product of V1 with this. Right? So this is equal to, so let me draw a line here, is equal to v1, v2 inner product minus v1 inner product with itself, which just cancels out, right? Ah, actually, I think we should have, sorry? I think we should have flipped this, no? Yeah, this should have been flipped. It's basically V2 minus V2 inner product with V1, not V1 inner product with V2. Yeah, because that's what works for us. Yeah, because the order matters, you see. it's a. It can be a complex inner product space as well, in which case we cannot be, uh, frivolous with the order of this inner product. So then, of course, this is 2 and this is 1. Yeah? So now you see, this is just V1 inner with V2. And this, when it gets pulled out, you take the complex conjugate. So V2, V1 complex conjugate is V1, V2. So this is V1, V2 upon 
v1 norm squared and this is also v1 norm squared. So, of course, these get cancelled out, this is equal to 0. So, indeed it is orthogonal, yeah. What more is there to be shown? That the span of these two fellows must be the same as the span of v1 and v2. But if you look at w2 here, what can you say from this expression? If you look at this expression here, this immediately leads us to conclude that w2 belongs to the span of v1, v2, right? That is the very definition of something belonging to the span of a bunch of vectors. It is written as a linear combination of v1 and v2, so it belongs to the span of v1 and v2. Now, if it belongs to the span of v1, v2, then what can we say? <clears throat> this is contained inside span of uh, v1 plus span of v2. I am not claiming anything about direct sum or anything, right? It is true, is not it? It is a sum. That containment is already known, right? But what is this? Yeah. So, what can we say about W1 now? W1 is belonging to the span of V1 and W2 belongs to the span of this. So, what can we say about the span of W1 and W2? It is contained inside the span of V1 and V2. So, span of W1, W2 is contained inside the span of V1, V2. But here is the deal. What is the dimension of this vector space? 2. What is the dimension of this vector space? So, you have a two dimensional vector space contained inside another two dimensional vector space. What is the obvious conclusion? So, this dimension is equal to 2, this dimension is equal to 2. See, that is the other side of the proof, right? We have said if you want to show two vector spaces to be the same, you show both sided containment, or if you can show one sided containment and the fact that the dimensions of those two fellows are the same, then you do not have to show both sided containment. Instead, you can just argue that they are one and the same, right? So, based on this, we have the span of W1, W2 is the same as the span of V1, V2, right? Is that clear? So, at least for the base steps we have seen, right? n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, we have seen this. The reason why I did this in somewhat detail is because now when we extend this for the inductive step, we have to assume that this is true for some p, for n is equal to p, and then we have to extend it for n is equal to p plus 1 and show that given it is true for n is equal to p, it must be true for n is equal to p plus 1. And you will see how the arguments and the reasoning and everything follows exactly these steps. That is why I did this step for 2. Normally, people would do just this step for 1 and then go for the inductive step. But it helps because this is already a smaller vector space with only 2 members. So, you do not get addled with too many variables here. But now, what we are going to do is go for the inductive step. So, this much is clear, right? n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2. The fact that Gram Schmidt procedure works and gives us an orthogonal set corresponding to a linearly independent set is at least proved or shown. This? Ah, this is just, you know, simple thing. So, this is in the span of V1 and V2. So, this is in the span of V1 plus V2 and this, uh, w, I mean, this is not that important here. But the fact that this is contained inside this and W1 is also contained inside span of V1. So, that is basically contained inside one of these fellows. So, the total span of these two fellows, because this fellow is also coming from this alone. So, it is also contained inside this. 
and this fellow is also contained inside this. So, yeah, so therefore this entire span is contained inside this entire span and then we know that this is uh, linearly independent. This is also linearly independent because this contains two non-zero vectors. First is non-zero because V1 is non-zero, second is non-zero as we have explicitly shown. So two non-zero orthogonal vectors must span a two-dimensional subspace. So therefore this is of dimension 2, this is of dimension 2 and therefore they are equal, right, okay. So now consider <coughs> V1, V2, Vp to be linearly independent with, so this is S with W is equal to W1, W2, WP orthogonal such that the span of V1, V2, Vk is the same as the span of W1, W2, Wk, right. So that is going to be our inductive step, the first thing. So this is assumed to be true for P.